Welcome to the first day of summer school here at St. Paul's University. We want to give a special welcome to those of you who are visiting us from other campuses, in particular our friends from the Omina Presbyterian Church, from that great congregation, each and all of you who are here. But any guests we have today, we're delighted that you're with us this morning. The name of this course, in case you wonder what you've registered for, the name of the class is Sin 101. Many of you, I believe, thought you were registered for Advanced Truth and Beauty, but our dean has decided that this course, Sin 101, is a necessary prerequisite for any kind of truth and beauty. We're not here, of course, to teach you how to sin. I'm assuming that all of us are pretty good at that by now. Instead, we want to try to understand exactly what sin is and how it works in our lives, especially at this interesting moment, challenging moment in our nation's history. To begin understanding what sin is, we have to go way back in time, way back to the dawn of time, and we begin with a story. Each evening, Adam and Eve meet God at the edge of Eden, right at the border where things grow a little hazy, and they meet God to eat and laugh and talk together. And each evening when he arrives, he calls their name, Adam, Eve, and when they hear it, it is as if they can hear the pleasure of a good haircut or hear the feeling of leaping into the bay and floating on the water. When they hear their name spoken by the Lord, it is mi casa es su casa. It is the first sip of bourbon or that first jolt of coffee in the morning. It's jumping your bike off a ramp into the beginning of summer. It is the sound of your judge and your maker saying, Hey, don't I know you? Adam. Eve. They're not here. Where are they? They're hiding. They are on the other side of Eden, of Eden, skulking in the shrubs, doing their best to hide from God because they ate the apple, because they broke the only rule that they'd been given, because they tried to be like God. And now they are ashamed at what they've failed to do, and they're appalled at what they've done, and they can't stand the thought of facing God they know they've done the worst thing possible. And all of a sudden, everything that they see is distorted. All that's in their field of vision is wrong. And suddenly, God is vengeful and existence is fearful. And there are threats all around them. They have fallen. And so they scratch at the dirt and they try to burrow deeper, desperate to get as far away from God as possible. They are now estranged from the love that made them and they are separated from the God who loves them. That's how sin came into the world. And that is what sin is. Sin, as the great theologian Paul Tillich once told us, Sin is separation from God. So here we have God, and here we have Adam, Eve, and the rest of us cut off from God. But as Adam and Eve are soon to discover, not only cut off from God, but also separated from each other, and also suffering sin's internal division, cut off from their own best selves. That's what it is to be a sinner to do the thing you know you ought not to do. Sin. You hear it, I hear it, and I start thinking about the sins that I've committed. I start thinking about that first apple, but also later apples. I've got a model of an apple right here. When I was 13 years old, my favorite thing to do was to throw apples. That sounds kind of innocent, but throw apples at cars at night. Across the street from my house, there was a uh, driveway that went high up into the air and a rock ledge like a small cliff and around the cliff there was a busy road snively road and my friends and I would walk up to the top of that ledge sneak into our neighbor's backyard and there were these crab apple trees this is a plastic tomato but they were as hard as a rock, really, these nasty little apples and we would get a bundle of them in our hands and when a car would come by and the driver would jam on the brakes or speed up, totally unaware of what had just happened or where these apples or rocks or whatever they were were flying from out of the air. It was a thrill to hit a car. One night we were up there with my friend Willie Wilson and a few other kids. 
We all had the thrill of our lives. Each one of us, for some odd moment, became Major League Baseball pitchers at the same time. And this sedan went by, and each one of us hit it, all of us. And then we hit it again, at least 12 apples hitting this poor car. Bam, 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 bam. We were so pleased. And then you saw this car jam on the gas, take a sharp right turn, and you could hear the roar of the engine as it come racing up this driveway. The driver knew where we were, and there was no place to go aside from over the cliff. We scrambled into the woods. He jumped out of his car, and he grabbed my friend Willie Wilson, and he picked him up, picked him up by his shirt collar, and he said, tell me your name. I was hiding in the bushes with my other friend, Steve, and we heard Willie say, Willie Wilson, and the man said, Quit lying to me, kid, and tell me your real name. And Willie said, it is, it is, it's Willie Wilson. My dad's Judge Wilson. And I started laughing so hard, I thought the guy was going to turn on me. But it was hilarious to see Willie busted like that, to hear him in this panic. One of the things about sinning is that your sins hurt other people. Sin exists in order to injure for the sinner's benefit. Bam, it was such a thrill to hit that car. Willie Wilson, it was hilarious to see Willie get caught. So we can, we can define sin, and we maybe ought to define sin, in one way at least, as an individual action that is wrong and hurtful. It's akin to misbehavior. And in that regard, we're talking about sin with a small s. That's true, but it's also woefully, woefully incomplete. Sure, we all have a track record of sins committed, small s, little sins. Why, though? Why do we do wrong? Why do we go awry sideways? Why do we sin? We sin because we all live within capital S, sins, dominion. We all live in thrall to the power that hovers above us and controls us. We live inside of it. As Paul said in our reading this morning, we live inside and under, excuse me, under a continuous, low-lying, black cloud. We're trapped. We're trapped in the dominion of sin, and this causes us to sin. Sin is the state that we're living in. And with every small s sin that we commit, we intensify its hold over us. Here's an illustration. When I was 23 years old, 10 years after I had the best thrill of my life, I was broke. And then I interviewed for a job bartending in a place that promised $300 a night in tips. The bar's owner told me I was going to be responsible for managing the other bartenders, ordering all the liquor, that I'd need to learn how to mix 200 different cocktails, and also that on cold nights, this was in Minnesota, on cold nights in the winter, I would need to throw homeless men out of the restaurant foyer when they gathered around the radiator for a little bit of warmth. And I heard all of those responsibilities, and I said, no problem at all. $300 a night in tips, no problem at all. And it wasn't a problem. They were bad for business. I didn't consider my sin until I tossed an extremely haggard version of the white Jesus painted by Werner Selman that hung on the wall of my Sunday school classrooms. Take that painting, starve him, deny him a bar of soap for a few weeks, and you had this guy I was throwing out into the cold. And as I did so, he caught my gaze, his eyes were kind. And I was absolutely rattled. I woke up to the sin that I was committing. And I realized I had to stop sinning. I had to quit that job. So I did. I quit about a week later. And it felt great. I had this wonderful sense of relief. Nine months later, I was enrolled in seminary. My sinful days were all behind me. Two years later, I took my first church job, an internship at this large church in St. Paul, Minnesota. And on my first day there, the senior pastor showed me the intern's office, which was right across from a little used but gigantic entrance in the building of this church that had to be unlocked in the daytime for fire code reasons because of a nursery school in the building. And in that foyer, there was a gigantic radiator. And the senior pastor said to me, sometimes 
when it's cold outside, homeless guys will gather in the foyer to get some warmth from that radiator. We can't have them here because of the nursery school. You're going to need to throw them out. If it's a problem, just go ahead and call the police on them. Wretched man that I am. Is there no one who can do anything for me? It took tossing a homeless man out of a church to underscore the fact for me that sin is far too strong for any of us to escape on our own. Here's a question for white people. How many white people do you know who smoked marijuana before marijuana was legal? Here's the second question. How many of them were arrested for possession? If you ask a black person those same questions, the first answer will probably be similar to the white answer, but the second answer will be 5, 10, 15 times higher. Do you know that on the average, white Americans hold seven times more wealth than black Americans? And what does that have to do with the fact that in study after study, black children report that white adults rarely smile at them? We're trapped in sin's dominion. And with every sin that we commit, we strengthen its hold over us. Last week, I was listening to a podcast on the Apostle Paul in preparation for this sermon, doing two things at once. I think I was making dinner and studying thanks to this podcast. It's British. And there's this British philosopher named John Holdane who was talking. And he was trying to define Paul's twofold understanding of sins dominion and sins committed in this plummy British accent that made him sound so refined and smart. And he said, you hear, he's like searching for a definition. And he said, you hear a lot about systemic racism these days. Well, Paul understood sin in similar terms. I listened to him and I thought, well, that's kind of like eating an orange and saying, hey, this thing tastes like Starburst, like the orange ones. Racism is a system that deprives black people of economic advantages and it is individual acts of bigotry. Each bigoted action reinforces the system's hold. And like sin, the whole enterprise exists to injure even as it benefits the sinner. So the similarities between racism and sin are not coincidental. In the verses that we heard Nancy read, Paul lays out the twisted truth of our fallen universe. Sin sets the pattern, and racism follows. Sin sets the pattern, and that's how racism works. And it's not just racism that follows sin's pattern. Race itself follows Paul's pattern. Consider whiteness as its own thing, not just some bland universal category against which everything else is defined, but as its own thing. Consider whiteness. Like sin, whiteness wasn't written into existence at the dawn of creation. Like sin, whiteness came into the world. Neither of these things came into being at the hand of God. In the 1600s, in Virginia, there was a man, I've got his name in my notes here, I can't remember it right now, I think it might have been, let's see, what was the man's name? In the 1600s, in the state of Virginia, colony of Virginia, there was a man, a New World African, named Anthony Johnson, this is the middle of the 1600s. Anthony Johnson was an indentured servant that was brought over from Africa, forced into indentured servitude, and he saved and scraped and used his own God-given talent and skills. He learned all of these things to secure his own freedom and then to buy a small piece of land and then to become a farmer and a leader in his community. And a couple of years later after that, a woman named Elizabeth Key did the same thing. At this point in history, the concepts of white and black were not in operation. But less than 50 years later, now we're in the 1700s, less than 50 years later, the kind of freedom that Johnson and Key secured for themselves was impossible for people of African descent because by that point, to be black was to be a slave, enslaved. 
here's what happened. In the intervening years, whiteness happened. It came into being. In 1676, something called Bacon's Uprising, Bacon's Rebellion happened in Virginia. A wealthy white landowner named Nathaniel Bacon was contending with the governor of Virginia, fighting against him in the halls of power in the capital, Jamestown. And Bacon eventually grew tired of talk and he formed a militia and his militia was comprised of freed Africans and freed Irish, indentured Irish and African servants, enslaved Africans and some poor white farmers. Bacon challenged Virginia's governor, as I said, and eventually his militia burned Jamestown to the ground. A few years after the uprising, a few months after the uprising, excuse me, Bacon died of a fever, his militia fell apart. But the Virginia elite, the wealthy landowners who ran the colony, they were rattled. They knew that they needed to stop relying on indentured servitude. They needed a populace that they could exert more domination and control over, just as the king had dominated and controlled his people. And so they began importing and enslaving more and more Africans. And they passed laws that said to be a descendant of an African was to be a hereditary slave. There was no chance to earn your way out like Johnson and Key did. And then they also, at the same time, wrote other laws giving political power to poor white farmers and landowners. And it's here, in these Virginia laws, actually many of them written in the 1670s, right before the 1700s, it's here that the concept of a white race first appeared in America. Whiteness is invented as a category in order to create and preserve privilege. As Noel Ignatius says, if you took the privilege away, whiteness wouldn't mean anything socially any more than having big feet means something. Whiteness is a system, a category created to confer privilege and retain privilege for some people at the expense of other people white people at the expense of black people. Sin exists in order to injure for the sinner's benefit. Or as James Baldwin put it, writing in the 60s, America became white in order to subjugate blackness. And in America, the best way to become white, the best way to stay white, the best way to preserve the power of whiteness is to put your knee on the neck of blackness. This past week, it seemed like every other sitcom actor with a TV show and reruns was apologizing for appearing in blackface in some stupid episode that they didn't quite understand six months ago. Well, why is that offensive? It's offensive, of course, because it traffics in the worst kind of stereotypes and it mocks the physical attributes of black people. That's reason enough not to do it. But the deeper reason, the reason we really recoil at it, or we ought to at least, blackface was created by poor Irish and poor Jewish immigrants in order to entertain the rich white people who discriminated against them. Degrading blackness helped Irish and Jewish Americans become white. That's how they entered whiteness, by holding blackness down, by mocking it, by defining themselves against it. Why did the Irish and the Jewish want to become white? because the category confers all sorts of privilege. It's much easier to get a home loan. All sorts of privilege at the expense of blackness. It might be hopeless if God were content to be separated from us, but God is not content to be separated from us. God is not going to let distance, the fall, be the end of the story. Sin is not victorious. God comes to us in Jesus. Right now we're getting a little bit of truth and beauty. God comes to us in Jesus. And although God's new Eden, heaven on earth, Christ's kingdom, although these things, which are the same thing, although they haven't fully arrived yet, they have already dawned in the midst of whiteness. Hope, hope lives. In the midst of the empire, covert rebellion exists.
So Christ's kingdom hasn't fully arrived yet, but it is already here. It's in your own heart sometimes. If it weren't already here, I'd still be kicking homeless men out of that foyer while helping other people drink themselves to death. Maybe I'd be doing the same thing to myself. If the kingdom weren't already here, I would never have awoken to my own sinfulness. And if the kingdom weren't already here, frankly, we wouldn't be trying to understand the problem of our own whiteness. If you're a white person listening to this sermon, we'd just be comfortable with the advantages whiteness offers, assuming it's the norm and everything else is some kind of deviation. If the kingdom of God weren't already here, you wouldn't be resisting what I'm trying to say. You'd just ignore me. But the kingdom of God is here, and even our resistance to it is a sign of that beautiful fact. And we can't ignore our whiteness any longer. Things are changing. Things are changing. How do I know that? Well, I know that because I know that God hears our prayers. And not just our prayers, also the prayers of our ancestors. And not just our ancestors, not just our ancestors. And in this case, when it comes to whiteness, I don't think he prioritizes the prayers of our white ancestors, but I do think he's answering other prayers, the prayers of other ancestors. In her poem, Slave ships. Lucille Clifton, great American poet Lucille Clifton, she writes one of the sadness, mo saddest, most painful things I've ever heard. The poem sounds like a prayer said by a newly enslaved African locked in the hold of a slave ship. It sounds like a prayer. It might be a prayer. It is a prayer. But as you read it, you begin to realize that almost every Christian word, with the exception of sin, almost every Christian word in the poem is the name of a slave ship. Jesus, angel, grace of God, all of them, the names of boats, owned by white people, used to carry people, black people, across the Middle Passage. Slave ships by Lucille Clifton. Loaded like spoons into the belly of Jesus where we lay for weeks, for months, in the sweat and stink of our own breathing, Jesus, why do you not protect us? Chained to the heart of the angels where the prayers we never tell are hot and red as our bloody ankles. Jesus, angel, can these be men who vomit us out from ships called Jesus, angel, grace of God? Jesus, angel, ever again can this tongue speak, can these bones walk, grace of God, can this sin live? Can this sin live? No, no, because the prayer was answered, because those prayers are being answered still this very minute. Just, but the prayer was answered and is being answered. Another poet, this one a musician, a rapper named Jay Electronica, said this in a song that came out two months ago. Rise up. All paths lead to Lazarus, the dry bones that lifted up from the valley dust. The prayers of the slaves are the wings that carry us. How is that true for white people? How am I carried by the slaves' prayers? How are they wings that are moving me? What happens to white people? When the prayers of the people, whiteness enslaved, are answered, black people, the ancestors of those slaves, electronica seems to be suggesting, are carried in a sense of sustained, right? Carried the way a mother carries her child when she is too beaten down to walk any further. That's not how the prayers of the slaves are answered in a way that carries whiteness, carries white people. We get carried all right, but not like that. We get carried more like a cow or a farmhouse gets lifted up and moved by the winds of a storm, moved into a new place, rocked, threatened, 
challenged, changed. That is how God is answering the prayers of the slaves. That's how those prayers are the wings that are carrying us. They're moving us into a very uncomfortable place. And that might not sound like good news. But who wants to live in sin? And even if we wanted to, the wind isn't going to stop blowing. Scripture guarantees it. What did Paul say at the beginning of this morning's lesson? Those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Brutal tyranny. Whiteness is especially tyrannical toward blackness, but it hurts white people too. How do I know that that wind is blowing? Well, I felt it just this last week. My son, Ethan, who's 13 years old, Kelly and I have three kids. The youngest, Ethan, is 13. He plays on a basketball team that is out of quarantine. That might be a bad idea. We're not sure yet, but they're playing these days. And they had their first tournament last weekend, and it was my turn to carpool. And I drove a car full of kids from Chicago down to Hammond, Indiana. So the car, the family Subaru, is full of 13-year-old boys. And in order to help prevent us from giving each other the coronavirus, Kelly made sure, and I made sure, that all the windows in the cars were rolled, the car were rolled down. And I took all the garbage out of the car first so it didn't blow around in the wind. You gotta clean out some garbage before the wind of God can blow through. So there we are, anyhow, these kids and me, black kids, white kids, black kids with white mothers, driving along, tearing down the highway on our way to Hammond. These kids were so excited, and they were certainly old enough at 13 to be well aware of whiteness and the toll that it inflicts on black people. And they were young enough, I think, still to be aware, young enough, the white kids, at least, of the toll that it inflicts on white people. And all of them were young enough to laugh out loud despite it all, to laugh as the strong highway wind whipped through that car while we raced to the first game they played in this time of pandemic and change. A magnificent wind is blowing. Some days, magnificent wind might feel like a euphemism for a tornado, and some days, for some of us, for people like me, it might need to be that. But it won't always be a tornado. It'll simply be magnificent some days. We need it to blow through our lives, our nation, and our church. And I thank God that we can feel it blowing. Amen. Class dismissed.